Welcome to Health Vision, WOUB's program on medicine and health. I'm your host, Jackie Wolf, Associate Professor of Social Medicine at Ohio University. Today's show is the first of a two-part series on diabetes. Joining us are Dr. Frank Schwartz, he's head of the Diabetes Center, and Dr. Karen Remsberg, Assistant Professor of Epidemiology, both are from Ohio University. Thanks so much, both of you, for being here today. Thanks. Frank, let me ask you a very, I know this is a difficult question, but let's start slowly. What is diabetes? Well, diabetes is a chronic disease of carbohydrate metabolism, or your starches and sugars. And what happens is, because of an abnormality in insulin function, you cannot utilize glucose from your diet like you should. And the short answer is blood sugars accumulate in the bloodstream that can cause symptoms, and they can cause acute symptoms or chronic symptoms. Okay, let's go back and analyze a little bit of what you said. You said a malfunction of, car of carbohydrate metabolism. So the way your body uses carbohydrates, there is a malfunction in the way your body uses carbohydrates. Is that? That's right. And you mentioned insulin. Right. What does insulin do to the carbohydrates that you consume? Probably the best analogy is that insulin is responsible for maintaining your blood sugar levels like a thermostat in your heater and cooling system is for your body, for the temperature in your house. And so when your blood sugar rises following a meal and you've digested food, insulin's released and that insulin does several things. It uses some of the glucose for normal metabolism as we're sitting here or out running and then it stores the excess glucose in the liver. And the liver is sort of like your bank. So you've got a bank for, and you store extra cash, which is your glucose, after a meal. And the rest of it is then utilized by your body. Okay, let's analyze a little bit more because you mentioned <coughs> blood sugar. And a lay person, I would think, would, would, would automatically think, okay, blood sugar, well, that's only if you would eat sugar would you have blood sugar. So we should explain that your body converts food to glucose. When we talk about blood sugar, that's the way your body use, converts food to energy, that's right? right? So we're not really talking about, you know, if you eat a normal meal without sugar, you're still, so explain what blood sugar is, because blood sugar is not simply eating sugar and thinking, and thinking that that's exactly what's being used. Right. The, the glucose level is our most easily utilizable form of energy, and it can be derived most commonly from carbohydrates, so that would be your starches. So dietary-wise, it comes primarily from starches. But protein and fat is also digested and absorbed at the same time. Protein and fat has to be absorbed and then also stored and utilized. In periods of fasting, when we don't eat, we can actually make glucose from stored fat, for example. And so, the carbohydrates are the major source, the easy source of glucose, but you can derive the glucose from your other food substances also. So when our blood sugar <laughs> levels rise, that is often, and that's one of the signs of diabetes, right? Well, all of us, our blood sugars will rise after meal. A normal person's blood sugar before meals or between meals is usually between 75 and 100. Following a meal, it will go as high as 135. So a normal person's blood sugars will normally rise a little bit and then go back down, and insulin is the principal hormone that regulates that. So insulin, the pancreas senses glucose rising following a meal, it's released, it goes into the bloodstream, and then it helps the glucose either be stored in the liver for future use, or being taken up by muscle for use for normal metabolism, for normal function at that time. Right, so either it helps your body, as you say, store it in the liver, or it helps your cells convert that blood sugar to energy, so that, and you, as you said, using it sitting here, or running, or reading, or whatever it is you're doing, we need that energy in order to right. function. And then following a meal, insulin levels drop, and they actually, they drop enough to allow the glucose to be released by the liver, when you need it between the next meal. So it really is a thermostatic mechanism to keep your blood sugars within a particular range. If we go out and we take a long walk or a bike ride, we need even more glucose to get to the muscle. Well, insulin does that. It allows 
glucose to be released by the liver, but it also allows the glucose to be taken up by the muscle and be utilized. So in, it has this balancing act uh, that maintains the blood sugar at that range. Okay, I, I want to go through in a few minutes about exactly what type 1 diabetes is, type 2, and gestational diabetes. But let me get Karen in on the conversation here. Karen, how many people in the U.S. suffer from diabetes? Do we have any kind of estimate? Yeah, about 21 million currently for adults age 20 and above, and that's about 1 in 10. And is this, is, have we seen a rise in, in recent years? Yes, over the last 10 years we have seen a rise. And how much has, has the rate of diabetes gone up in the last 10 years? Um, well, it depends at what state. Uh, what state in the country you're looking at, but probably about 50% in a lot of states. Oh, and that's that's a quite a precipitous yes, rise. Yes, yes. And has, do we see that rise um, more so in the area that we live in, southern Ohio and western West Virginia? Yes, definitely. Um, and at the current rate for children who are born in 2000, if it increases at the same rate, um, one in three children will develop diabetes in their lifetime, and one in two minorities. And so this is quite an extraordinary figure, because yes. one thing that's been in the news lately, and it's been in the national new news, is the estimate that the generation of children today are a generation, the first generation in U.S. history to probably not live as long as their parents. That's the estimate, largely because of diseases like diabetes and the risk factors that contribute to it, like, like obesity. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about those risk factors. What, who is at risk for diabetes and what kind of risk factors cause diabetes? Go ahead, Go ahead Karen. Um, well, so there are the risk factors that we can't change, like our age, and as we get older, we're more likely to develop at least type two diabetes. I assume we'll get to it in a minute. Um, and then also African Americans, Latina, and Native Americans are at greater risk for developing type 2 diabetes. And obviously we can't change our ethnicity, so these right. are risk factors that we can't right. change. we can't change those. Uh, then of the things we can change would be our lifestyle changes. So um, if obesity and um, losing weight, um, Exercise. physical activity, um, diet, those things would be some of the primary factors. And these are things that we can actually do to prevent it. Yes. It's also things that we do once we know that we have it, but it, we can also exercise, eat right, keep our weight down right. to actually prevent it. Mm -hmm. um, Frank, let me, let's talk a little bit about type 1 diabetes, which is the most serious form of diabetes and usually shows up first in children or young adults, is that right? Well, it can cause the most acute illness. It's, it's the one that people think is the most serious. Either one of them can cause really serious complications. But type 1 diabetes is a condition that's seen primarily in children and young adults, but can occur at any age. And in that process, the cells that produce insulin are destroyed. The most common cause now is an autoimmune disease. In other words, our immune system mistakes the beta cells which produce insulin as being foreign and we actually destroy them with our own immune system. And so there's a lot of research going on right now to find out how that happens, what is the trigger. We blame viruses right now. So we think following some viral infection in people that have some genetic risk, that triggers your immune system to attack the beta cells and destroy them. 